and brings us to our action item, action agenda, item number 13, and we had three items on our executive session tonight. The first is item 3A, which is selected employment item shown in Exhibit A. Do I have a motion? Mr. Cates. Mr. Chairman, I move we give approval to selected employment items, Exhibit A. I have a second. Ms. Hutchison seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That passes unanimously. That brings us to item 3B, which is the 2019-2020 reappointments shown in Exhibit B. Do I have a motion? Mr. Cates. Mr. Chairman, I move we give approval to the 2019-2020 reappointments as would dis was distributed in Exhibit B. We have a second. Ms. Hutchison seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That passes unanimously. That brings us to item 3C, which is the legal briefing, legal advice, and an update on the civil action shown in Exhibit C. Do I have a motion? Mr. White. <clears throat> Mr. Gann, I have a motion. I'd also like to read a brief statement into the record. Um, Mr. White, did you tell me a little earlier you might have copies for the board? Or you want to yeah, I can hand out copies. And, okay. um, take a look. But I'm going to go ahead and, and read, the rec read the statement in and then make the motion. Okay. And I, I would like <clears throat> to tell the board Mr. White told me he was planning to make a motion and he might need a little more time, so I hope you all will be patient. I have granted him that time. I mean, given the magnitude of this lawsuit, it's, it's worth putting this into the record. Uh, whereas Kim Murphy has previously initiated multiple lawsuits against School District 5, including a suit seeking to prevent the district's approved development of Chapin High School around June 2010. Shortly after the filing of that suit in, De in November 2010, Ms. Murphy was elected to a Richland County seat on the school board. And whereas even after she was sworn in as a member of the Board of Trustees, she continued to pursue her legal appeals and challenges to the students' new and renovated facilities at Chapin High School. The taxpayers decided to move forward on the expansion of Chapin High School through the democratic process and reasonably expected that the School Board of Trustees would protect and preserve the district's property and assets, including the protection of its property rights against abusive litigation construction delays, wasteful cost increases, and a trustee's efforts to pursue personal interests with school property to the detriment of the school district students and taxpayers. And whereas as trustees of public property and servants of the public interest, school board members are bound in the management of all school district affairs to act in good faith and with due diligence and prudence for the benefit of the school district and its students without regard for their own personal interests. And Whereas the voters of the district approved a bond referendum in 2008 that provided for improvements to and construction of facilities in the district, including renovations and student facility upgrades to Chapin High School. And whereas it appears that Ms. Murphy, who opposed the bond referendum in an effort to stop development of the approved improvements at Chapin High School, in order to further her own personal interests with the school district's property at Chapin High School, filed and prosecuted three administrative law actions, including appeals, opposing the permitting for aspects of the new Chapin High School student facilities. And whereas all three of the legal actions that Ms. Murphy instituted involved in Chapin High School were unsuccessful and DHEC granted the necessary permits, the permits were received by the school district after Ms. Murphy's legal actions significantly delayed the development of the student facilities at Chapin High School, deprived the students at Chapin High School of the benefits of the upgraded facilities for two years, and based upon the district's 2012 determination, imposed more than $10 million in unnecessary additional cost on the school district and its taxpayers. And Whereas after being advised by state authorities that while elected to a Richland County seat, Ms. Murphy did not reside in Richland County, a determination subsequently approved by the South Carolina Supreme Court, Ms. Murphy was removed from the board because she was ineligible to run for the seat, be elected to the seat, 
or serve as a member of the board elected from Richardson County. And whereas Ms. Murphy instituted the lawsuit in question, captioned Kim Murphy versus Richland Lexington District 5, <clears throat> by and through its board of trustees and through counsel to the board of trustees, civil action number 2013-CP-40-1897. And whereas in response to this action and to protect the taxpayers who will bear the expense of the unnecessary additional $10 million in costs, the school district instituted a compulsory counterclaim for the losses sustained because of her actions. And whereas after the court granted summary judgment to the school district on Murphy's claim, she was to appeal and as an accommodation to her, the district waited to proceed on the compulsory counterclaim until after her appeals were resolved. And whereas the school district's compulsory counterclaim against its former trustee, Ms. Murphy is a conscientious effort to protect school property and legal interest. And whereas Ms. Murphy alleged that she had a direct and personal interest in the matter, opposing the renovations and new student facilities at Chapin High School. Her appeals and legal actions opposing the school district's approved use of its property for Chapin High School students in pursuit of her private and personal interests cost the district's taxpayers amounts estimated to be more than $10 million. And whereas her actions deprive the students of the timely use of new improved facilities at Chapin High School, just as the school district would seek to hold anyone accountable for damages to school property caused by their improper and disruptive acts. Here, the school district is not bullying or punitively attacking Ms. Murphy. Rather, it is our obligation as stewards of the school district's resources and assets to protect its students and taxpayers' interests to hold Ms. Murphy accountable for the consequences of her abusive appeals and lawsuits in pursuit of her personal interests. And whereas the matter is nearing trial in an effort to promote a resolution to this matter, taking into account a resolution that protects the district, students, and taxpayers from further wasteful and unnecessary litigation, as well as protecting Ms. Murphy's constitutional rights. I would move that the board make the following offer to Ms. Murphy to resolve this matter with the offer remaining open until April 18th, 2019 at five o'clock p.m. The district will agree to dismiss its counterclaims against Ms. Murphy with prejudice upon approval of the court on the following conditions. The parties will execute a consent order that provides for a period of five years from the date of entry of this order, Ms. Murphy shall not file any legal action, including but not limited to any petition, motion, complaint, appeal, extraordinary writ, or other matter against School District 5 of Lexington and Richmond counties, or any of its officials, agents, or employees in any state or federal court including any administrative law court or administrative agency without complying with the following pre-filing procedures. Number one, Ms. Murphy shall provide written notice to the school district of her intent to file an action or proceeding by serving the district with such notice in the pleading, petition, motion, or other papers she proposes to file. Service shall be in the manner provided by Rule 4 of the South Carolina Rules of Civil Procedure. Following such service, Plaintiff shall request a conference the chief, with the chief administrative judge for administrative purposes for the fifth judicial circuit and notify the district of her request, the pre-filing conference. The request shall include a copy of this consent order and proposed filing and shall be served on the district. Upon receipt of notice that a pre-filing conference has been scheduled, the plaintiff shall immediately notify defendant in writing of the date and time of the conference. The submission of such a request shall toll the statute of limitations as to any proposed underlying claim. At the pre-filing conference, the court may inquire into the proposed pleading or papers compliance with rules 11 and 12 of the South Carolina Rules of Civil Procedure. Based on that inquiry, the court may allow Ms. Murphy to proceed to file the action as presented or may direct Ms. Murphy to address identified deficiencies or may reject the proposed filing because it does not comply with <coughs> Rule 11 or 12. Only after the Chief Administrative Judge approves a requested filing may Ms. Murphy apply, file the pleadings or document with the clerk, court, or another official. 
Should Ms. Murphy file any action without the approval of the court, she agrees that the court may enter a judgment against her in the amount of $2 million. The judgment shall also provide that Murphy is liable for the prejudgment interest from the date of any unapproved filing together with cost and attorney fees incurred in collecting the said judgment. For purposes of the proposed order, Ms. Murphy includes Kim Murphy individually as well as any entity or organization organized, incorporated, or assembled by her or in her control. That's, that's the full motion, the record statement and the motion. Okay. Mr. White's made a motion. I have a second. Ms. I Hutchison. second it. Ms. Hutchison seconds. Have any discussion, Mr. White, since you made the motion, I'm coming back to you. I, I would. I know there's a lot of technical stuff in here, but Ms. Murphy is represented by counsel. Um, but it, basically what this motion says is this district, even though we've incurred damages in excess of $12 million, as a result of her frivolous lawsuits, which she lost every single suit. Um, we're willing to dismiss the suit, provided she does not bring another frivolous lawsuit against this district for a period of five years. That process with the court allows the court to decide if she has a bona fide appeal, not appeal, but a bona fide lawsuit. She may have something unrelated to these prior uh, uh, cases she brought. For instance, if she had a a reason to believe that she was injured or harmed by somebody while on school property or some other notion of a lawsuit, a court could permit that, but it, we don't want her going out again and trying to interfere, disrupt, or defeat our schools. And I and also say for the board's benefit, I personally observed on social media uh, right after the election, Ms. Murphy posting something suggesting to people they could bring a wetlands appeal against the new Amex Ferry project. This settlement is basically for her to say she's going to stay away from directly or indirectly trying to interfere with our schools. Um, and the, the idea of, of a $2 million uh, consent order is that is totally within her discretion and control. She doesn't file a lawsuit that the court hadn't approved. There's nothing this district will ever try to collect from her. If she agrees with this um, and, and violates it, then we would be pursuing the monetary damages of $2 million. That number was in lieu of the $10 plus million plus of damages we actually incurred. This is a, an effort to bring a resolution of this that still allows her to bring legitimate claims if she has them against the district, but to stop the frivolous lawsuits. Mr. Loveless had his hand up, and I'll come to you, Mr. Cates. <clears throat> Chairman Gant, with all due deference to you, nothing has disappointed me more in the past than to see you and Kim Murphy spar in public participation primarily over these issues. Ms. Murphy, a settlement is an accord that memorializes give and take for each party. I urge you to settle your claims. Please consider the items that you may believe that are unpalatable, modify them, but accept this offer. Please do this for the good of the group, yourself, and let's move on. Thank you. Mr. Cates. Mr. Chairman, I offer this as a correction of what I believe is Scribner's error and not an amendment to the motion. On page four, item three, um, I would ask Ms. Sowers to um, correct the official copy. I, I believe that should read Mrs. And I read and it, it as Mrs. Too. And you did read it as Mrs. I just wanted to make sure that the written part of that was corrected. Also, the same uh, in uh, item two. <clears throat> Mr. Kate, is that it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Hammond. Ms. Hammond, you make sure your green light is on. I thought it was on. Isn't it on? It is. Can you hear me? Uh, well, it's on. It's on. It's on. We can hear you. Um, I'd like to say that over, over a long amount of time, too much money, time, and energy have been deflected from what really matters. And my hope is that this legal offer will be a fair opportunity to end a legal matter that continues to drain both parties and allow a way out for both sides and to keep Ms. Murphy from harm of any countersuit. Okay. Any other 
any comment? Ms. Hutchison. I do also hope that um, Ms. Murphy accepts this proposal um, to end this, and I would like to see an end to, as a result, see an end to the frivolous lawsuits. It has cost taxpayers over $10 million, and that is money that cannot be recouped, cannot be recouped. And from the estimates, it is well over $10 million. Just as um, when I was asking some questions earlier, it, came, it was explained to me that, you know, if, if any of us had someone come to our house, perhaps destroy all of our windows, we would definitely take that person to task, whoever did the damage, and require them to pay us to get the windows repaired. This is no different. We are asking for, or we were asking for damages um, incurred against taxpayers of School District 5. So I think it's been very fair. I think this is an unbelievably fair proposal, and I do hope that it ends, um, ends all of this lawsuit. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. I would also like to say that I, I would hope that this would be highly considered and that this would end the uh, lawsuits that have approached 10 years now, multiple, multiple lawsuits. This counterclaim came after 2013, but it would be my hope that this could be agreed to, this could be done We'd, at the 10-year mark. It's time for this to be over. Frivolous lawsuits have cost not only millions and millions of dollars, far beyond this $2 million in here in this lawsuit, but it cost our students probably 18 to months to two years of lost opportunity to be in a newly renovated, new added on to Chapin High School. And it, it really, really has been a high cost to the community. And it's, in my opinion, it's time for it to be over. So this is this board's attempt to end it. It asks one thing, that frivolous lawsuits be stopped. So with that, uh, any other comments? Seeing none, all those, uh, we've had a motion, we've had a second, we've had discussion. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. White, please raise your hand. And that motion passes unanimously. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. White, you are going to provide a copy to Ms. Stowers? Yes, I provide. And we, she has a copy. Okay. All right, great. All right, that brings us to um, item number 14, which is the approval of the textbook adoption shown in Exhibit D. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Gant, and Board of Trustees. I would like to discuss and, and first thank the Board of Trustees for allowing the textbook discussion to be moved to an action agenda item. I just wanted to thank the Board for that for a few reasons. Number one, our staff, which is in attendance tonight, it allows them to be here once versus twice, which honors their time. But then also, number two, it allows for us to be able to start the process much sooner and start the pre-ordering process for textbooks. So thank you. I'd like to start off by thanking our Board of Trustees for the action item this evening. We have brought forward several textbook recommendations that you will see um, attached to this in Exhibit D. These textbook recommendations have taken place after committees have met and discussed a lot of uh, textbook recommendations that the State Department of Education have sent to us. The uh, uncertainty of funding that Mr. Richardson will always talk about in a little bit, it also applies to textbooks as well. We're never sure exactly how much money the state is going to allot for textbooks because they determine how much money and then how, which textbooks are adopted. But we, with our committees, have to make sure that we go through the process so we're prepared once the State Department, the South Carolina State Department of Education has made those decisions. So, we have brought forward several recommendations, and I'd like to thank certain people in the audience today. 
We have a few of our coordinators who have spent countless hours working with our teachers and our schools to prepare the recommendations that are in the packet today. We have Ms. Boisenau, our math coordinator. We have Mr. McGinty, our K assistant director. We have Ms. Tammy Richardson, our gifted and visual and performing arts coordinator. And we have Ms. Kathy Sproles, our uh, world languages coordinator. And we have Ms. Boland, our science, health, and physical education coordinator. And then also, Dr. Robin Cox is in the audience. She organizes all of our textbooks for our district. So I'd like to thank them for all their work, and especially all of the teachers and committees that spent countless hours preparing the recommendations for you tonight. So thank you all that are in attendance tonight, and for those that are not in attendance. At this time, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you may have about any of the recommendations that you may see for there for our textbooks, and our coordinators are here to respond to specific questions that you may have. Mr. Cates. Mr. Chairman, in order to discuss the item, I'd like to make a motion, and I apologize, Dr. Giuliano, I was trying to vote on it and, and <laughs> not have to have you do that, That's but okay. I, I wanted to make a motion that we approve the textbook adoptions in Exhibit D and also express the sincere appreciation from the board for the hard work. Having been on committee as a parent, it's a quite overwhelming task, and I thank you for your efforts and for the outstanding materials our students have as one of the aids our excellent teachers use in the classroom. We have a second. Ms. Hutchison seconds. And that brings us to our discussion, which you just helped us with. So now we're going to go to questions. So, uh, Mr. Cates, did you have a question? You had your hand up. Who has a question regarding these textbooks? I, Ms. Hammond. I have a general question, not about any specific textbook. Um, is it still the deal where you have to spend the money allocated on textbooks? You know, it, in a, it, that's the way it used to be. My point as a teacher, I'm going to say, a lot of students today, you know, there's so much online, and of course, you buy the textbook and you get online textbook. But I can tell you, and I, you know, I can just speak from my school and my teachers I'm around, the kids do not, especially with one-on-one -on -one tablets, we really just need a classroom set, which would save I can't even tell you, I'm sure, how much money if you did not buy every kid the history book or the whatever book. So my question is not anything you've put here, but I was just seeing if we've made any grounds trying to explain we don't need that much money allotted to textbooks and it could go some other places we could really use. Typically, it comes together as a package. So the package that's offered whatever the package is for that particular company, they may offer textbook with whatever comes with it. So certainly it's the package that they offer and we have to accept whatever package comes with that. Right. We don't necessarily have say that we like this piece and that piece. We have to take the package that's offered to Does us. Does every textbook now come with the, um, with the digital connection to it so that they can a absolutely, because yeah. they always have that option for the yeah. students. So like you said, they don't have to carry that textbook if they and so they, choose. And they really don't use it, I, I promise you. <laughs> oh, well. Just, and and mm -hmm. I've, I've been told, I, I've had this conversation with legislators. They, what I think happens, too, is, of course, there's a big lobby group from the textbook company. Mm -hmm. so, but, you know, it's just kind of sad sometimes if you, if you could actually, um, you know, find out the amount of use of a very expensive book, and they are really expensive, and they get, you know, torn up or smashed in a locker and never used. So, you know, the, the part I really know about this, that's what bothers me, not what you brought to us. I'm sure they're really good textbooks. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Hutchison. I just wanted to follow up on that. That was a great question, Ms. Hammond, and I'm not sure if I quite understood the, the answer. Um, I think, Ms. Ammon was asking, can we just purchase one set for the classroom? And save the money. We typically cannot. It depends on whatever they offer to us. We have to accept what the offer is from that company and whatever the state approves with them. So, so the offer would be you're going to get 180 history books. Is that what you're saying? Is Some of them goes? do. A lot of times they may say one per student. Sometimes certain companies offer less than one per student. It just depends on whichever one we pick 
and choose and then whatever package comes with that. Okay, so that's where the requirement is, is saying one per student. Yes, so sometimes we're not sure exactly what comes with the adoption until right. it's time that they have allotted the money for it, and then we find out what comes with it. At this process, we have to choose the textbook and the materials and resources that go with that, and then we find out later a lot of times exactly what pieces come with that. So even as our committees are examining everything now, they're not positive exactly every little detail of what's gonna come with that. But they have to choose the best option based upon what's presented to them. Thank you, that's pretty amazing, and I agree with Ms. Hammond. That we can lose a lot of waste. <laughs> that is really, it, that's really a waste, and it's too bad that, that we have to follow that, but I do understand. I think Dr. Melton wanted to add something to the discussion, Mr. Levis, I'll come to you. I, I appreciate the questions, and I'd like to applaud <coughs> Mr. Giuliano and the coordinators. They have made sure that our policy regarding textbook adoptions have been fully implemented throughout this process. So these committees that Mr. Giuliano is referring to are the committees that policies require that we do. But Ms. Hammond and Ms. Uh, Hutchison, just for you and the community to understand, and I'm gonna use some fictitious numbers. So let's imagine we are assigned $100,000 by the department through the depository where textbooks come through the State Department. Dr. Cox would love to say, well, let's get a class set so we can save $85,000 and use those towards else place. We can't. We have to have textbooks assigned to students of record. That's part of Dr. Cox's responsibilities, Mr. Giuliano's. So unfortunately, at the end of the year, when the, when the bills come due from the depository, that's where the charges are applied. If a student has lost a textbook, Ms. Hammond, you manage this on a yearly basis. If there have been damages to the book or a textbook has been lost, those costs have to be applied directly to the student. If we were to have a classroom set, how would you track where that came from? The teacher. So, as you all prepare to go to your advocacy, um, that may be something you may would like to add to your agenda, some flexibility of how funds such as that are spent so that we could use it towards project-based learning, we could use it towards more consumable items, or another way to really enhance the instructional program in which we're trying to devise, rather than textbooks being the place where we truly are investing a lot of state, and I need to make sure I say that twice, state, taxpayer money, that is not a local controlled item, that is, those are funds from the State Department of Education through our state allocation. Hopefully that brings a little bit of clarity, Mr. Gant. Mr. Lovis, uh, Mr. Giuliani, uh, being a neophyte at this, I need to ask a couple of uh, probably obvious questions, but does the state offer a list of, of different textbooks in each course matter that, that you can select from and then, and then the committee studies each one of the books and then decides amongst itself. Is that, is that the process? It is, and each, each company or each um, offering, there may be different numbers. So for example, for Algebra 1, there may be three or four choices, where Algebra 2 may have just one or two choices. It depends, and that varies. But yes, we look at the ones that the state has approved and then choose from that approval list. Okay, so that takes us out of the politics of how the books get into the list. Okay, so we, we okay, that, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, thank you. It's control. Ms. Gardner. Just, just for clarity um, <clears throat> for me, the list that you gave us of these textbooks, this means these would be changed from what we currently use. Like, I don't know how many of these are what we're already currently using. Sometimes it's the same company or the same book, but it's a newer model based upon what they may have selected. Sometimes it's a complete brand new company. And, and it also depends upon which ones of these textbooks are funded. So sometimes they're fu some textbooks are funded right away. Others it may take a little while later because maybe some new money came to the state and they say now we're gonna fund this particular textbook, which has happened in the past. So we're prepared for whatever may be funded at this point. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Can I do a follow-up <laughs> to that question? Um, is it the state or is it us? I think you just said it's the state. But when you can get a, a new a revised version or a new book, is, or is it a rotating thing like every three years or every four years? They have a rotating process that they go through, but because of funding issues, it doesn't always necessarily come through in the schedule that they have. Sometimes there's delays to that rotating process. So sometimes it, there are delays, but they do have a rotation. So it's the state, that's correct. Okay, it's the state. And then uh, I know I can just speak for like math or science or history. 
they sometimes will have a workbook, but but from my experience, and I and might not be in Lexington Five, but that's what I want to know. In mine, the workbooks are extra; they don't come with the book as a package, and and sometimes they're pretty valuable, especially for an on grade level kid. Mm -hmm. So I would see, I would love to have money saved where they could have a hands on workbook, say for U.S. history or whatever, that, that works for that core subject, and it might not be for others. But I was just, if, if we can ever, as y'all are doing this, if there's ever a, um, one of their we, reasons for us to buy their book might be they say, well, the workbook comes with it. But I've just, we've just always had to pay extra. And I know we've done away with fees with Dr. Hefner, right? There's no fees now for workbooks, whereas we used to could push that price on to the student, correct, Dr. Okay. Mel? We've reduced fees, and that's coming up with Mr. Richardson's presentation shortly, but there are some places where fees are still required for some of the courses that we're going to be offering right, next academic year. But yes, ma'am, we have reduced the fees. That's been a critical right. effort of ours through the finance department for the last two years, Mr. Richardson? Three? Okay. But while we are on textbooks, I just would like to say for, for certain students, the hands-on paper copy is still valuable for learning. And so anywhere they give us the workbook, get it. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Cates, <clears throat> having served on the committee, if I remember, most of these packages include the workbook, and then even though the textbook's not replaced everywhere, uh, a contracted period of time, they resupply the workbooks. So that, that was a part of the, the package in, in, in a lot of cases. That's correct. A lot of times those consumables are a part of the package for a period of time, like you mentioned. Right. And, and I think it also, because we're going to soon shift to discuss the budget, I remember being on that committee and it was a little bit overwhelming as we spent hours and hours and hours on government econ, only have the state to say for I don't know how many years, oh, we're not going to fund government econ. So just because we have this list of great text doesn't mean we'll, we'll get to purchase all these texts uh, next year. Quite yeah. frankly, we'd be shocked if, yeah. we, if we did. So it becomes one, one resource for our exceptional teachers, and, and I think that's why the use of technology in the classroom is, is so valuable, because as the textbooks get outdated, uh, our, our teachers are able to, to supplement that, and really it's the other way around, the, the textbooks is a supplement uh, to what what they're doing and and the multifacets that they approach lesson plans. So I appreciate the effort that's gone into bringing this forward, and I think it is a point of advocacy for us all to say we would love some more local control over how those funds are spent and um, what what we're able to negotiate for as far as online resources and consumables. So thank you. Thank you. It looks like we're at that point, but I know we've dodged the question all night. We know it's a status symbol for most of the kids, especially middle school kids, to bring home an 80-pound <laughs> backpack. <clears throat> I don't know how their little bodies do it. So since we're, since we're approving this tonight, hopefully, I don't know how the vote's going to go, let's solve that problem. Let's get them to think about that technology piece, and they don't need that book every day. Home, room, but all of us have watched that, and I don't know, I guess in my days, way back being on a school improvement council at Dutch Fork Middle School. It's been an it's been an ongoing issue. The weight of a a full backpack full of books and the and the little backs that are forming and molding. So I don't know the answer to that. I know you all don't either. Mm -hmm. And if I get that if we all get that answer we can probably fund our own <laughs> books and do what we want to do. So Mr. Gann, I know <clears throat> I've said this, but you know what they do with those rolling book bags? I mean if they can get a rolling book bag, you have to have a special permission. But you know what they do? Because they are online, they don't take the book home. So nobody's really carrying around heavy books that much. I mean, it, it's really, that's, that goes back to my point that Ms. Hutchins and I are talking about, and it's out of our control. But I'm just saying, honest, that's another reason about the heaviness. There are parents that say, hey, if the book's online, we don't need to bring a book home right. with every mm. kid every night. It, it you, must, I don't it must know be like that's going to get to the heads of the people. It must that be like them. baseball trading cards, because they I do know. bring them <laughs> home. I've watched it at several middle schools that they do. They still do. All right, we've had a lot of great discussion, but all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. 
and the book, textbook adoption motion passes unanimously. So thank you all for your efforts and your work. And Mr. Giuliano, thank you for your leading the discussion tonight. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't think we would be offended if those folks that were here to uh, represent those textbooks decided to call it a night. So <laughs> we appreciate you being here, and, and please don't stay we'll just because hand. of us. Thank Let's you. Give them a hand. You know, I know, I know all those people. They're independent thinkers. They were getting ready to walk out on us. <laughs> you won't offend us. We, we they, get it. They you've been here. You've had a long day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Cates. All right, that brings us to item number 15, which is our first reading of proposed revisions to board policy GBEC, Drug and Alcohol-Free Schools slash Workplace, and GBEC-E, Notice to Employees, shown in Exhibit E. And I would, I would say to you all that we, this is first reading. We had a discussion last time, and there will be a second and final at a subsequent board meeting. Mr. Cates. Mr. Chairman, I move that we give first reading of, a, of proposed revisions to board policy GBEC, Drug and Alcohol Free Schools Workplace, and GBEC, Stroke E, Notice to Employees, as presented in Exhibit E. And do I have a second? Ms. Hammond seconds. And now for discussion. Mr. Cates, I'll come back to you if you have anything. No, sir. Okay. So I'll open it. I'll open the floor up. Mr. Loveless. Um, I had a discussion with the uh, council this afternoon about this, and uh, I'm, uh, this is personal to our family, and we lost a nephew to uh, intravenous, intravenous drug use, and I want to see, I want to see, uh, I know we talked, that, that the council and I have talked about that the, this policy includes um, drug testing for cause, but I know it's for all employees. I mean that that would that would cover us in case of uh, a situation where something happened. But I want to see a proactive um, drug testing. I want to see hair follicle testing for all employees. And um, I know we had some incidences at one of our high schools, and that doesn't need to be, when you lose somebody in your family, it doesn't go away. That's not something that, that, on, that I think this board on our watch needs to ever see. And if we can prevent that one time, that means a lot for one family. And I think that we have, have, have cause to suspect some things, and I think we need to have, have that drug testing of all of our employees. I'm going on record as saying that, and, and I'll just put it to you this way, is that it hurts to lose somebody that close to that. And it doesn't need to happen. And, um, Maybe I'm too close to the fire, but that's just the way I feel about it, so. Any other discussion? Mr. Lovis, I, I appreciate your, your comments, and, and I think this, this policy, and I, unfortunately you missed our discussion last time, but the policy is an improvement over a policy, but it's not to where you, yeah, what you just true. described. <laughs> and I think what we have to keep in mind is that uh, these policies, don't go away. We, if we revise this policy and add this language, it takes it to a reasonable suspicion level. So it's a step closer, and it gets us it gets us closer to having an active policy sooner. But I I heard from your heart what you just said, and I believe that probably in a in a future policy or revision we can do better, and we just have to somehow we can figure out how how we can do that because I don't think. We want to lose one child in this district or one former child in the district. That's a heavy price to pay. But uh, I appreciate your comments. But I do think this is a move in the right direction to have this reasonable suspicion piece added because we haven't had that. We have not had that at all. I, I agree that it's a move in the right direction. Ms. Hammond. I was going to say um, Mr. Lovelace did miss, miss the conversation we had 
with the, with the briefing about it too. And I think um, one of the, and correct me, other board members, if I'm remembering all it might help you understand it. Um, and I think I brought up that you had shared that with me, um, but we were explained that there's also rights of teachers or employees. And if we made it where it was, and I think I asked the question if, if there were any districts that tested every, every employee, and I don't think there was, right, Dr. Melton, that we knew of. Not based on legal counsel that we had in attendance at the last executive session, no ma'am, we were not aware of one. Right, um, and I'm not saying there isn't, and I, and I get your point too, well taken. Um, but I think we were looking at it as adding something that did help us, and I was gonna ask about mm -hmm. clarification that. That'd be like if the principal or another teacher or, or a custodian, whatever, suspected something, because of the way some they could go to the authority and it would you know it could be handled whereas before we couldn't do that so i was just saying that for mr lovers that we did really talk about it a lot and and i tried to share your heart about that and and we we just got advice of why that was not feasible at least at this time thank you miss hammond any other comment see none all all those in favor of first reading of proposed revisions to board policy GBEC and GBEC E. Notice to employees shown in Exhibit E, please raise your hands. And that passes unanimously. And that brings us to item number 16, which is the approval of locally designed elective courses shown in Exhibit F. <clears throat> Juliana, do you I know you sh shared with us last time. If you want to share a little bit, we'll we can go ahead and get a motion. Uh, that, Mr. I was going to try to move him right through. <laughs> he did such a good job Mr. last Kate time. Kate keeps me on my toes over here to the left. All right, Mr. Kate. Mr. Chairman, I move we give approval to the locally designed elective courses in journalism, newspaper uh, production, CP and honors, um, journalism four yearbook production, CP and honors, student government leadership one. Uh, student Government Leadership 2, Student Government and Leadership 3, and Student Government and Leadership 4. I have a second. Ms. Hutchison seconds. Is there any discussion? Great. Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that passes unanimously. Mr. Cage, you're a wise man. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the record. <laughs> That brings us to our discussion agenda, item number 17,